You know, I mean, when somebody had a headache, we used to think it was a demon. We'd pound a head, you know, a hole in their skull. But we realized that's probably not a good idea because headaches aren't caused by demons. And we stopped. But yet for addiction medicine, I think we still do the same archaic, very puritanical, rooted treatment options. Welcome to Health Professionals in Recovery, a podcast for healthcare practitioners interested in substance use disorder, harm reduction, and recovery from addiction. Our hope is to provide education and support for those struggling in silence, recovering, and those who care for patients who suffer with substance use disorder. For more resources, please visit our website at www.healthprosinrecovery.com or follow us on Twitter at HPIR Podcast. And now, the hosts of Health Professionals in Recovery, Sean Fogler and Bill Kinkle. Hello, and welcome to Health Professionals in Recovery. Uh, I'm your host, Bill Kinkle. And for this episode, we're going to play a recording from a recent webinar that uh, both Sean Fogler, myself, Dr. Peter Grinspoon, and Leo Boletsky participated in that was organized and moderated by Zach Siegel from Changing the Narrative, where we discuss physicians' health programs, uh, nurse monitoring programs, and really what it's like to be uh, a participant in one of those programs uh, day-to-day and what the experience is like. And so we hope you enjoy this episode and look forward to bringing you new episodes uh, very soon in the near future. So to get started, um, my name is Zachary Siegel. I'm a journalism fellow at Northeastern University, which is in Boston. And Changing the Narrative is a initiative that I, uh, you know, help direct and lead at Northeastern University. Uh, for anyone not familiar with Changing the Narrative, we are a sort of loose collective of uh, doctors and researchers and, and, and people in media, and we're uh, all sort of working together to raise the standards for how we discuss uh, addiction and, and drug use. And, and uh, we really truly believe that a, a more uh, science-based and empirical focus in this uh, field, especially when it comes to journalism, is critical. And given the uh, all of the uh, issues with, with overdoses and and all the focus on, on deaths of despair, now is a critical time that accurate information gets out there to people. And so today's topic, we, uh, we have some very special guests, and we're going to uh, get into that in a minute. So some beef brief background on this topic. Uh, currently, if, if you're a doctor or a nurse and you develop a substance use disorder and you would like to keep your job and retain your license, either as a clinician or a provider, you must abide by the rules of what's called a physician health program. And uh, there's also other entities and, and oversight uh, boards and uh, programs out there where if you're a nurse, there's a, there's a group for nurses. If you're a physician, there's a group for physicians. So we'll, we'll get into that. And so what uh, we're, we'll start with PHPs though, these physicians health programs. So these date back to the seventies and they were formed as a way for doctors to help their colleagues struggling with alcohol and drug use. And so today PHPs oversee uh, the treatment process for many different kinds of healthcare providers, mainly physicians, of course. These, these are state run programs, and they really make critical determinations about compliance with treatment and recovery programs. And it has a huge impact on someone's career, and we're going to get into that. So, the, the primary reason that, that changing the narrative is tackling PHPs today is because of uh, mainly their policy toward treating opioid use disorders, but also I think we should zoom out a little bit out of opioids and just talk about the way that, you know, addiction, or whether it's alcohol or opioids, is treated broadly within these uh, systems. And of course, like it must be said that often abstinence-based approaches are, are favored, especially when it comes to opioid use disorders drugs like methadone and buprenorphine, they are uh, opioid agonists, which means that they, they activate similar receptor sites that, say, heroin activates, so there's a bit of a controversy 
about people using these drugs in in a, in in, uh, in the healthcare settings, and so this is a big topic that we want to get into. And so, uh, one last note uh, again: why we're talking about this. So, some of the original uh, founders of changing the narrative, Leo Bolutsky and Sarah Wakeman, along with their colleague Kevin Vasella. They authored a perspective piece in the New England Journal of Medicine very recently titled, Practicing What We Preach, Ending Physician Health Program Bans on Opioid Agonist Therapy. And in that piece, they write, systematically denying clinicians access to effective therapy is bad medicine, bad policy, and discriminatory. So they also argue that, that these sort of the, the scientific and, and the medical rationale for denying the use of these treatments is, is outdated. It's, it's uh, rather unscientific. And in some cases, it does just appear to look discriminatory. So to talk about this further, we have uh, a couple people who've been through these programs. And uh, to begin, we have uh, Dr. Peter Grinspoon, who is author of an addiction memoir called Free Refills, and he teaches at Harvard Medical School. And we also have Bill Kinkle, who's a nurse in recovery and is co-host of the podcast, Health Professionals in Recovery. So Bill and Peter, uh, thank you both for, for coming in to, to, to talk about your experience today. Thanks for having Great. us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, Great, really and I also- topic. I also want to mention that that um, Sean Fogler is also here. And Sean, would you like to introduce yourself and and let us know who you are? Sure. Uh, my name is Sean Fogler. I am actually the community outreach coordinator at the Pennsylvania Harm Reduction Coalition. I'm also a person in recovery. Uh, I'm also a physician. I practiced anesthesia for about a decade till my license was suspended. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here, happy to contribute. I spent a couple of years in a physician health program and I'm still quite connected to, um, to the culture and you know, regularly attend Caduceus meetings and actually provide peer support to a lot of physicians that are still practicing that are in recovery. Awesome, yeah, it sounds like your perspective will be uh, very helpful throughout this, this chat. So, um, like like I was saying, after uh, after this New England Journal of Medicine piece came out, um, it really you know sh shined a light on this topic, and and then and NPR also did some some great segments featuring both Bill and Peter. And Bill, I, I wanted to start with you since since you're currently in the midst of of uh, treatment, can you can you talk about what it's like? Um, you know, to be to be a nurse, to be trying to go through this program, and also just you know a bit about what what your program is like as a as a nurse in recovery. Sure, I mean it's fascinating. In the beginning, I think I was so desperate to get my license back um, that I was willing to do anything. Uh, but as I progressed in recovery and really started to to do a lot of work that was purely on my own, despite everything that the the monitoring program was doing, uh, I found that there were a number of things that greatly contributed to my struggle with opioid use disorder that I wasn't addressing uh, because uh, financially I couldn't afford it, still can't afford it, and uh, time-wise I couldn't fit it into my schedule because of all the hoops that I need to jump through. Uh, to satisfy the requirements of the, the monitoring program. And so I'm not in a PHP, and it's interesting, some states, nurses are part of PHPs, but Pennsylvania doesn't operate like that. Uh, ours is a little bit different. There's the the nursing board, which is the, the licensing authority, and then we have um, sort of a go-between called PNAP, the Peer Nurse Assistance Program. Uh, and they sort of operate similar to, uh, I suppose, like an EAP. Uh, where if you call and say you have a problem, they'll talk to you and then they'll send you for an assessment somewhere and then you go for this assessment and then based on the recommendations from the assessing place, which more often than not uh, is a treatment facility and the one that I went to was a treatment facility that had multiple locations around Pennsylvania. 
um, so they have a vested financial interest in designing what your treatment's going to look like. But their recommendation, uh, whatever their recommend, recommendation is by the assessing service, that's what PNAP will then say, this is what you need to do. So for me, that was a year worth of treatment. That was a full 30-day inpatient, followed by three weeks of partial hospitalization, which is five hours a day, five days a week for three weeks, and then about three months of intensive outpatient, which was three hours a day, three days a week for several months, and then for the rest of the year, it was general outpatient, which was a, an hour and a half session per week you would have to go to. Uh, on top of that, there's an initial 90 12-step meetings in 90 days that you have to attend, followed by a minimum of three 12-step uh, meetings a week for three to six years, depending how long. And on top of that, there's, um, you know, you have to have uh, an addictions medicine specialist that you see, and that all has to be documented. You have to have a primary care doctor that they're in contact with and have full, um, full authorization to see and communicate about your medical records. And see what else. And then drug screens. So you check in daily uh, through an app on the phone to decide whether you're randomly selected for a drug screen. And then you have to go for those drug screens, uh, which are pretty costly and have other issues, with it, which I suppose we could get into later. Well, just to, uh, just to interject for a minute, that's an exhaustive <laughs> list of uh, of things to do. Um, thanks, thanks for breaking down that whole i mean that that is so much to 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 get into just from there so maybe yeah. taking a couple steps back can you maybe uh if you have any insight into this i'd love to know how this uh whole process originated like like who came up with the idea that this is uh maybe how a healthcare provider trying to get their license back ought to be treated like what is this all based on um, so I'm not sure what the so I'm, I, I suspect the the original thought was you're an unsafe practitioner, and so what's paramount is public safety, uh, which it should be. I mean, we have a great responsibility as physicians, nurses. You know, we manage you know, medications that could harm people, and and we you know, there should be some type of governance over. Or license, or at least some type of minimum standard that, that they can certify. So I suspect that that was part of it was public safety. Um, but remember, when these programs originated, um, we the whole idea that this may or may not be a disease or a legitimate illness was not the case. You were seen as you know the dregs of society. Uh, and when I was a paramedic student and when I was a nursing student, this is what I heard: uh, that these people are pieces of crap. They don't deserve our care. And it was made very clear in my nursing program, don't ever do anything, don't do drugs, don't get caught doing drugs, because we're going to publish your name in our by, or, you know, our journal to, and tell everybody that you're doing drugs and you're going to lose your license. And so there was this very stigmatizing approach, and that's still, this, that's still how it is in a lot of ways. I mean, my name and a lot of detailed information about my drug use was published by the Board of Nursing, which is public record. Anybody can go find it. Uh, on the internet. So I suspect in the beginning it was purely based on stigma. And I don't believe that they've caught up uh, now that we know that what we did was wrong to people and that this is a legitimate illness and very responsive to proper treatment. Uh, the way that we, you know, the way that we treat this and the way that we go about it, my personal opinion uh, that I suspect, I, I think it's still based on a lot of stigma. Uh, and I think they operate under the guise of public safety, but it's still about doing, instead of, so a lot of things we do in, med in medicine w would be, how can we get this person back into a healthy lifestyle? Whereas I, how I see PHPs and these monitoring programs is, how can we ensure, how, what can we do to make it so difficult to prevent this person from ever being in this place again? Um, so it's from a place of power, and that's sort of how I see it. And mm. The, the other piece is that, you know, we can say all day long that addiction is a disease. I mean, I was at the state capitol yesterday and heard this, but nothing that we do around addiction medicine treats it like a disease. Everything that we do treats it like it's a moral failing. Uh, and what I go through with the, the monitoring program is exactly that. I mean, I'm forced to go at least three days a week and be told over and over again how I need to pray away my disease, in quotes. 
And so I, I've just never been able to understand that. On a one side, you say it's a disease, but the, the only cure for that disease is for me to either believe in or design my own God or higher power and then turn my will and my life over to it, then go apologize and make amends to every person in my life that I've ever harmed, and then commit myself to a life of prayer. And that's supposed to be how my disease goes into remission. And coming from medicine, when I, I didn't start struggling with substances until I was 34. And so coming from a, a life in academic medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, I, I was completely baffled by this. I couldn't comprehend because we just don't do things like that in medicine. You know what I mean? We used right. to, uh, you know, I mean, when somebody had a headache, we used to think it was a demon and we'd pound a head, you know, a hole in their skull. But we realized that's probably not a good idea because headaches aren't caused by demons. And we stopped. But yet for addiction medicine, I think we still do the same archaic, very puritanical, rooted treatment options. So I would love to pivot over to Peter now. And so Peter, I loved your hearing your voice on NPR when you mentioned for the first the, the first time that you heard the Lord's Prayer was while you were going <laughs> through addiction treatment and you said, quote, Why would you send this Jewish atheist to a religious Christian rehab place? place in Virginia. So, you know, jumping off from where Bill sort of just left us, can you talk about your first encounters with, with how addiction is treated broadly and then how it maybe is slightly different given that you're a physician? Well, I agree with almost all of what, what Bill said. Um, a lot of it is punitive and it shouldn't be punitive. And I think the punitive components are a vestige from the past. And I think over time, it's ideally becoming less punitive and more sort of therapeutic. But there are two aspects of it, one of which I know we're going to talk about, the fact that they didn't offer us, um, you know, medication for opiate use disorder. Um, and two, the fact that they just send you to these random rehab places um, when there's really no evidence that rehab even works at all. Um, and they also don't give you much of a choice about where they send you. They give you a list of like three or four places and they say, if you don't go to these places, then we're going to report you to the board. I mean, they really have sort of a gun to your head and because it's not a, you know, it's a metaphorical gun, but if you don't do what they say, they just give a letter to the board saying you didn't comply and then you'll never get your license back. So you essentially have to do what the physician health program says. And that's one of the um, complaints about them is that they have no oversight. Um, there's no independent um, way to kind of get a second opinion. So if you think they've got your case wrong, there's nothing you could do about it. If they say you have bipolar and you feel like you don't, you can't get an independent opinion. So they gave me a list of rehabs and um, all of them were like these 12 step abstinence based religious um, programs. Now I think they're lightening up a little bit and they're sort of responding to criticism and they're giving people a little bit more choice from what I understand about where they can go. But they literally sent me to a, uh, this is in 2005, a rehab center in um, Virginia, which was pretty religious. And again, they would end the meetings, for example, by everybody holding hands and reciting the Lord's Prayer. And I just felt so kind of culturally disconnected from this that it really, didn't feel like it was helping my recovery at all. If anything, it felt like it was like alienating me. I mean, some of the people I really connected with, so that helped. And, you know, just being in a safe place, we, there aren't drugs and alcohol helped. But I didn't think that anything else that the rehab did uh, was useful at all to my recovery. And, uh, you know, they make you pay for 90 days and they, you're away from your kids and your family and your everything. Um, it's very disruptive. So I think that there's a really old fashioned component to what they do sort of a one size fits all, as opposed to really taking into account what the physician or healthcare provider is going through. Um, so I think they really need to evolve what they do. Um, I think that they do have a pretty high success rate for physicians, uh, despite the fact that they don't give them the one treatment that is known to be life-saving, which is Suboxone, which I know we're going to talk about. Um, the reason they do have a high success rate is, I believe, that they provide long-term follow-up. They follow you for three to five years. And, you know, I look at what I'm able to do in my primary care clinic, and um, I don't have that kind of follow-up, uh, unless I'm very lucky and it's a very stable patient. So, and you think about it, it's a chronic disease. You need long-term follow-up. 
And also the fact that, you know, you're seeing a psychiatrist, you're seeing a therapist, you're going to support group meetings, they're drug testing you, which can be very humiliating, expensive, and demeaning, but it also can keep you honest. That's like a, a double-edged sword. Uh, but the common, and, and finally, they have a lot of leverage over you. Um, you know, if you flunk your drug tests, then you will never be a doctor again, is a lot of leverage. Um, so there's sort of this combination of things they do that does result in about, according to them, 70 to 80% of the physicians using this abstinence-based model uh, succeeding, which isn't 100%. I know two doctors that have overdosed. I know a bunch of doctors that um, are homeless. So it's, it's certainly not 100%. It's an awful disease. And, you know, I just want to add that I, I know a lot about PHPs because I both um, was a client of a PHP for five years. It took me three and a half years to get my medical license back. So I had a couple slips. And then I was an associate director for the P same PHP in Massachusetts, sitting at the same table, but on the other side of the table, helping physicians uh, as one of the directors. So I've really seen it from both sides. And I think that they really deserve a lot of the criticism they get, but at the same time, they help a lot of people. And finally, the last point I'll make without giving a whole TED talk is it's hard to know how much of the problem is with the PHPs and how much of it is with the medical board. Because a lot of the stuff the PHPs do is because they think the medical boards are just not gonna accept it um, or because of the stigma of the medical board. And the PHPs are trying to tee the physicians up to get back to work. And it's sort of like, why come up with a plan that the medical board is just gonna shoot down? And I find that the medical boards are really where a lot of the stigma is coming from. At least the PHP I worked with, the people were fairly reasonable and open-minded, but it's kind of like, why would we put um, this person on, for example, Suboxone if the medical board's never gonna let the person come back to work on Suboxone? So it wasn't entirely the PHP's fault. A lot of it, uh, re a lot of the blame r resides in the medical board. Yeah, thanks, Peter, for uh, sharing your experience. And I definitely do wanna get into that bit on medication and, you know, since we do have a third uh, person with us who's, who's also been through this experience, John, I was wondering, you know, uh, based on what Bill and Peter said, how does that stack up to your experience, if you want to chime in and share? Sure. I, um, I agree with most of what both of them said. You know, my experience was a little different because I voluntarily went to treatment in 2015. And it wasn't until I got into legal trouble from the past um, that the PHP reached out to me. So I was about a year and a half into recovery when I entered. And just like Bill said, I really, uh, I was like, I'll do whatever you want me to do because I want my license and I want to practice. And um, what I found with a lot of positives. Um, I definitely think, you know, the therapy and the testing, especially early on, was helpful. Um, and also some of the group therapy was was pretty powerful and effective. Um, I, th I think like Peter was alluding to the very cookie cutter rigid approach um, is potentially lethal, you know, and for me, it wasn't an issue. But for many, I knew and that I still know they struggle in it and it can be very abusive and they do have a lot of power and a lot of leverage. And uh, and I do think a lot of it comes from the medical board. I mean, even like I mentioned earlier, the automatic 10 year suspension in, in Pennsylvania um, is that's from a rule, I believe, that was that came about in the late 70s or early 80s and the Pennsylvania Medical Board continues to use that, whether you wrote one prescription or 10,000 prescriptions. And um, so there's a lot, there's a lot, I mean, it's tricky. And, you know, the other thing is in Pennsylvania, not only do we have a PHP, but we have a PHMP. So when you're in the, a, a physician in recovery that's enrolled in the PHP that has an active license also must be enrolled in the PHMP. And they and all they do is extra testing, um, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's very redundant, but it's what the board wants and it's the way the system is. 
and it can end up you can end up being tested five six times in a week um which is definitely <laughs> excessive to say the least um so, you know, for me, I was in the program for two years. I withdrew once I knew I was losing my license for 10 years. I'm almost five years into recovery, certainly healthier in, in every possible aspect and would certainly be an asset as a physician, but that's not possible. Um, you know, and now I'm doing, you know, harm reduction work um, and drug policy and trying to work on, you know, crafting better laws, but it's it's very different. It, it's very difficult. And the stigma within the medical profession, I have found, is far greater than anywhere else. Um, and it's, you know, Bill and I talk about this a lot, but it's the litmus test is how do we treat our own? And we treat our own badly. You know, I know plenty of physicians that are dead, you know, because of this system. And I know plenty that are thriving. Um, and I think we have to do much better. I think um, addiction, you know, like like any disease, you don't, somebody comes in with hypertension, there's not just one medicine. <laughs> there's not just one strategy. And addiction is very complex. And we're trying to squeeze everybody into, you know, the square peg. And it's it's not an effective system. And, it's, and it certainly doesn't um, do anything for physician health and wellness, you know, and we haven't talked about burnout or suicide or trauma. Um, and that stuff gets lost because the people in physician health programs, they're just doing whatever they have to do to get the hell out and get their li and keep their license and move on. And that's a powerful motivator. And yes, they boast a very high success rate, but um, there's a massive selection bias, right? I mean, I'm in recovery and healthy and I'm not in the program. I'm not in those numbers. And how many are dead? You know, how many um, have we lost? It's, I think those numbers are very skewed. Um, and the short is they do a lot of good things and they do a lot of dangerous things and it's gotta be better. And we haven't even gotten into the medication discussion. Right. Um, Just, that's really my two cents for now. Thank, yeah, thank you, Sean. I think, um, yeah, hearing the three of you, you talk about this, it sounds, of course, like, like uh, it's just such a, there's so many gray areas here. Obviously, the three of you are, uh, you know, in my mind, like uh, amazing, inspiring people who, who've been through this and have gotten, gotten uh, you know, healthy lives back and are doing wonderful things in the world. And like you're saying, not everyone, um, treated through these systems winds up that way. And so let's talk about one of the, the key issues that, that brought us all together. So uh, pr uh, Professor Leo Boletsky is, is amongst us at the moment, and he uh, co-authored the New England Journal of Medicine piece, sort of, you know, really putting the pressure on PHPs and asking them, you know, why are you not uh, letting uh, physicians and nurses and other healthcare providers who have opioid use disorder, why aren't they allowed to be on the, the, the best medicine that we know treats them? And so, Leo, um, do you wanted to chime in for a minute and sort of talk about the, the thrust of your paper, why you wrote the paper, and sort of what, what the goal uh, is now moving forward? Yes, thanks, Zach, so much for organizing this, and, and thanks to our guests who are uh, you know, just brave as as brave as they are, articulate and and talking about their experiences in a context where it's not just stigma, but um, you know, your arguably your livelihood is on the line, and that's maybe something that we need to talk about as well as the financial implications of all of this, which are devastating. Uh, but to answer your your immediate question, I uh, uh, re you know kind of uh, learned about this grand paradox. There's a couple of these, you know, huge paradoxes in, in American healthcare. There are a lot of them, I guess, but, you know, things like the fact that it's easier to get, uh, you know, Oxycontin than, than it is to, to, um, to get buprenorphine, which is the treatment for, for um, opioid use disorder that some may develop from taking Oxycontin. And, and when I first learned about the de facto prohibition uh, for healthcare providers from being on opioid agonist therapy, so buprenorphine and methadone, which 
the healthcare profession has been on the vanguard of trying to increase access to these medications, but but healthcare professionals themselves cannot be on those medications and at the same time as they as they're practicing. It, it just totally blew my blew my mind, and um, you know I think represented both on the individual level a huge problem because of you know people like bill sean and and peter and many others who who have struggled with addiction and would have been um you know helped by accessing these medications so on an individual level there's a lot of tragedy and there are the lucky ones has been discussed because many others did not make it um, but also on a population level from a public health perspective the fact that the healthcare system does not practice what it preaches is is a huge is a huge issue and you know creates a cognitive dissonance for people um who may point to the fact that and, and they do i actually i mean i think one of the things that spurred me to write about this um was uh, you know a lot of the <clears throat> speaking that i've done around opioid agonist therapy and the need to eliminate barriers almost every time someone raises their hand during the discussion and says what about doctors and pilots you know why why do you say that abstinence doesn't work when it does work in fact so it's a fault you know you're kind of giving us the false narrative and you know if if it's good enough for doctors and pilots why isn't it good enough for everybody else and that really um, spurred me to start looking into into this um, you know system that we have for for um, licensed professionals, uh, lawyers actually also are in the same boat, um, and and so we you know the research is is very much mixed and is full of huge. Um, Polls, in the sense that, as as was already mentioned, there's a, an enormous amount of selection bias, and you know, basically PHPs, I would say, cooking the books in how they represent success rates, and a lot of times the attrition that happens in the programs is not um, is not tracked. Uh, a lot of times, folks who have opioid use disorder will never enter PHP, so so those folks are not really counted. And and uh, a lot of people who do enter PHPs, in fact, do not have an, uh, an, a diagnosable addiction issue. You know, they may have been caught uh, smoking weed when they shouldn't have been. And so there's a referral and that person enters an abstinence-based uh, treatment regimen and they succeed. And uh, that is not an indication of the success of the program. And so this is, it's really a question about really messed up um you know sort of eligibility criteria that that makes people um mandated to enter these programs so it's from a research perspective there's a lot of problems with those data um so so we looked at the data and um you know basically wrote this advocacy piece that talks about the fact that um you know we really have to align what the health care system advocates for which is improved access to medication for addiction treatment and what it actually practices when it comes to their own people um as well as i think and i'll just you know kind of point this out we don't have to talk about it now or even at all but i think it's worth saying that you know the idea that phps focus on clinician wellness um, I think bears some critique in the sense that, you know, the reason why a lot of clinicians um, do end up experiencing um, substance use disorder and uh, other behavioral mental health issues has to do with the fact that the healthcare system, um, as well as, you know, medical, clinical education and, and the practice of medicine or nursing or whatever you're practicing is not really humane. And people get worked to the bone and stressed 
um, you know, from from the sort of the policies and practices of the system, from the abuse that they take from patients, from the abuse that they take from administrators and insurance companies, and that all drives really elevated levels of um, man mental behavioral health problems, suicide, and so forth. And then the system basically kicks people down when they're kicks people when they're down. So once you start experiencing problems. Uh, you're mandated to enter systems of care that are not very supportive, um, not universally so, but you know there are major, major problems. And so, so it would be incumbent upon those systems, the uh, physician health programs and other, you know, professional wellness organizations to actually organize and advocate for the root causes of the problems that they purport to treat. And and I think that should be part of this conversation as well. Yeah, thanks, Leo, for, for spelling that out. And, and one, one thing I want to get to uh, before we sort of open up the, the floor a little bit here is that one of the main arguments uh, that PHPs and medical boards sort of make to uh, against prescribing opioid agonist therapies is the sort of neurocognitive uh, diminishment and sort of the sensory motor stuff. Can you uh, maybe do, do do you think it's important to elaborate on, on that argument? Because in your piece, you spell out how you know it's sort of flimsy. Like like it's not necessarily the case that someone on buprenorphine, for example, uh, is at any kind of diminished capacity, be it uh, physically or mentally. Yeah, I mean, I'll make my comments brief because there are clinicians in the virtual room, but. Uh, you know, the idea that universally being on opioid agonist therapy is diminishes your capacity is in fact reinforcing the same myths that this, the healthcare system itself tries to dispel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being on agonist therapy, if it's well calibrated and patient centered, should not cause, uh, you know, substantial impairment. And it, it may or may not. And and so are um, you know so do many other kinds of medicines, which are not restricted in the same way by the PHPs. So that you know right there is the the most vivid example of a double standard towards these these medications rooted in stigma, and not science. So mm -hmm. um, you know uh, the impairment is important. Impairment is a huge issue in medicine. There's a lot, you know, uh, medication errors kill a lot of, uh, some people estimate about 50,000 people a year are killed by medication errors. Their medical errors kill far more people. So there's lots of issues with impairment and other kinds of system functioning. But um, a lot of times those, you know, that impairment is actually caused by the structure and function of the healthcare system, such as, for example, ridiculously long hours that people work. Um, they're caused by, you know, basically underworked, uh, underpaid and overworked people. Um, maybe not, you know, physicians so much, but uh, other kinds of staff. And so if, if impairment is an issue that we care about, there are very much, you know, clear, sources of impairment that we're not talking about. We're talking about, you know, individual level sort of medication responses, which vary substantially. And right. so, you know, if we're going to focus on that, let's focus on all the other sources of impairment, like other medications, age, lack of sleep, and so forth. Um, right. And we need, to, we need a measure of impairment that actually measures impairment, not an arbitrary measure such as being on a specific medication. Yeah, um, and thank, thank you for that, Leo. Um, I, I think, you know, turning back to, to Bill and, and, and Peter or, or Sean, you know, um, we, we have your experiences to, to draw from here. And, and I, I, I do want to, you know, get back to just like the day to day sort of experiences. Uh, uh, of being treated in, in these systems. And, and so, you know, you both, Bill and Peter, recently, you know, were on NPR sort of being vocally 
critical, not not in like a malicious way at all, but but critical of these systems. When when you sort of protest or or complain or or, or make these criticisms, uh, how are they received? Do, do you get a lot of pushback, or do you get a sense that maybe you know there there are people working in these systems that 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 hear you and 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 want to do better? Uh, this is Peter. Oh, go ahead, Bill. No, you can go, Peter. I'll, I'll wait. Oh yeah, the yeah. the people at the mass PHP were upset. And they um, challenged the idea that there was a de facto ban on Suboxone, and they they denied it. Um, and um, I, so I disagreed. I didn't think there was anybody that was given Suboxone when I was there as an associate director from 23 to 20, 2013 to 2015. And there certainly wasn't anybody given Suboxone back in 2005 when I was in recovery. It was never even – discussed as as an option but what they did tell me is that they they're giving people more option more leeway about where they go um for rehab um they're, they're giving people the option to stay in state they're not sending them halfway across the country and they say that they're really lightening up um about about the whole suboxone issue and um again they agreed with me we agree that part of the issue is the medical board like they can't let Someone, I mean, they could let someone be on Suboxone, but it's not going to be that helpful if the medical board's not going to let them uh, go back and practice. Um, I, I just want to echo what, what Leo said. Um, you know, doctors I work with every day are allowed to take Ambien the night before, which makes you brain dead the next day. They're allowed to drink the night before. During work, they're allowed to be on muscle relaxants, antidepressants, Topamax, gabapentin, which makes you sort of like a pithed frog. They're allowed to be, we're allowed to be on anything. And it's just stigma that makes them focus on the, on Suboxone. And, you know, having had an opiate addiction, I, I wasn't really on Suboxone officially, but I, you know, I certainly dabbled in it and it really doesn't impair you very much. Uh, certainly not as much as a lot of the medications that we're actually allowed to be on. So I certainly agree that it's pure, it certainly needs to be studied, like all this stuff, but it's it's pure stigma that that makes people focus on suboxone. But um, to get back to your question, they they were upset, but um, they also understood that it this is an issue that people are very concerned about, and they're working to improve it. And um, again, a, a part of the problem is that they don't have complete leeway. Uh, just they they're they're very constrained by the medical board, so it's not as simple as the PHPs need to do a better job. They're doing it in the context of, um, you know, they, they function as a dual role. They're trying to help patients and, and certainly they could do, or help physicians. They could do a much better job. And I agree, they could be more proactive and work on burnout and so forth. And they do some of that, some advocacy, but they're also trying to uh, finesse um, with the clients um, treatment plans that the board will accept to let the clients go back to work. And if they deviate from a certain certain parameters, the board's just going to say, "Forget this. You're not going back to work." So they do have a complex dual function. The end goal of which is to help people get back to work. And if they if they um, stray from that too far, the board just shoots um, the client down. So it is a little bit complicated. Um, and I think it's important to understand that they they are trying to help and the board uh, limits how progressive they could actually be on certain issues. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that, Peter. Uh, Bill, do you want to chime in? And, and same question to you, uh, you know, day to day, you know, you're, you're obviously a, a, a vocal critic in, in your own way. Uh, what's that been like? I mean, I haven't heard much at all um, from them about the NPR piece or any of that stuff. I mean, what I have heard from them, uh, because I'm really clear on my monthly progress reports of, you know, you have to fill out this form of, you know, what do you think's positive, what do you think's negative, and you're in your recovery. And so I list uh, all the time the two main negative aspects of my recovery is the process for drug screens. Um, for me personally, being uh, a rape survivor, uh, for the long, for the first couple of months, I couldn't understand why I felt so cram, so crummy. Uh, after I would go for one of these screens, I would have anxiety, and it wouldn't feel right. And it was, you know, I was talking to my wife about it one night, and realized that the whole process for giving a screen um, gives me flashbacks of being in jail and being raped. 
of just being stripped down, being patted down, having someone treat you and speak to you as if you're in jail. Uh, it's a, very punitive, and then they have to stand there, and it's a witness sample, so they have to stare at your penis as you give the sample, and then just the nonverbal communication by the staff, it's very clear. You know, and again, this is my peers. I mean, I have to go and see nurses and physicians to have these screens. And so I talk a lot about this whole process. Uh, you know, the, the presupposition is I'm being dishonest. And I mean, Peter even just, you know, when he was talking about the, the drug tests, you know, talking about them in the context of, you know, if you flunk a drug test. And, like, I think that's, to say something like that, I think is very much like, I think that's from conditioning and treatment. You know, I don't, I've never passed or failed a drug test. I've had positive or negative screens. And I think that matters to speak about them. And, you know, when Peter was saying that he, he thought that they helped him to keep him honest, um, and I think that's part of the philosophy of this presupposition that we're going to lie and we're going to try and get something over on them. Whereas I would argue that if I got appropriate treatment, uh, you know, the only reason that I would be dishonest uh, is because I wasn't having my underlying, the underlying factors that orbit my substance use disorder, those things weren't being addressed and I wasn't moving towards a, a phase of healing. And so I would use to cope with that. And the reason I would lie about it is because I knew that it would be a very punitive response to my positive screen. So my argument would be that if I would get the appropriate treatment, you wouldn't really have to worry about my honesty too much. And so I write on these forms every month that I, I find these screens to be highly traumatic for me personally. And I would like to work with them to come up with an alternative way to do this um, so that I'm not re-traumatized because one of the underlying factors of my use, use of heroin was, you know, sexual abuse and at an early age and then subsequent rape later on. So it seems kind of counterproductive to put me into a, a position where several time, times a month I have to be re-traumatized to the exact scenario that drove my use to begin with. And then that's going to be used as the deciding, you know, diagnostic factor to declare that I'm now safe to practice, even though we did nothing to treat the underlying uh, trauma that I have. You know, so it's all, in my opinion, it's, it's much more about a series of checks and balances to say, okay, he did all these things and he's safe. Um, and so the other thing that I typically write in my reports every month is just how I find 12-step um, meetings unhelpful. And I don't mean that in a way that I don't, I don't think 12-step programs are helpful. I think they're incredible and wonderful for many people, just for me personally, because again, this is a program that is supposed to be designed for me to recover and become well again so that I can be the most efficient and safest uh, practitioner. Uh, I find it an extraordinary waste of time. Uh, it interferes with my personal life. It interferes with rebuilding relationships with my family. Uh, sometimes I go and I hear things that I just can't, uh, comprehend it's just not helpful for me I mean I'll give a quick example I mean one day when I was at work I um, mean I work in a harm reduction capacity in Philadelphia and one day I mean I was on the street reversed several overdoses ran across across several friends who I didn't know were back out on the street homeless spent the day trying to help them in the midst of it ran into the guy who raped me when I was in jail who's now on the street still uh, wrapped up in addiction and had to try to process through that while I had to run out of work to go to the lab to give a urine where I had to be stripped down and all that kind of stuff and it'd be re-traumatized about the rape that I just saw the guy who did it. And then because I needed a meeting for the week, I had to then run right to an AA meeting. And in that meeting, it was a topic meeting where we discussed forgiveness. And I heard over and over again how if I ever have any hope of recovering and staying in recovery, I need to forgive everyone who's ever harmed me. And then by the time I got home, my kids were in bed, and I got home just enough time to say hi to my wife, and we went to bed. So the most helpful thing for me in that scenario would have been to come home and spend some quality time with my family, who has been my greatest support system. And so this is sort of what a day-to-day -day looks like, trying to do all these checks and balances. I don't really have time to do the things that I think would be the most beneficial for me. And so I write these things on my you know, these monthly reports, um, but I don't write it in a, in a criticism way. I write it in a way that I'm honest, but in a way also that I would love to work with uh, the program in Pennsylvania to try to improve it, to make it more tailored to the individual so that we can help identify what are the underlying factors that drove your drug use, and then can we work on those? Like, I'm fascinated by what, what Sean and Peter said, uh, that they saw a psychiatrist and they got therapy. I don't get any of that. 
I get rehab treatment, which is just 12-step groups and sometimes groups led by other people that are in there with you, other, other patients. And, and I get 12-step meetings on the outside and a boatload of uh, drug tests. I've gotten no therapy. I've gotten no counseling. And I don't have time. You know, and the thing is that I would love to have that, but I don't have the time or the money um, to, to, to do that. But the only feedback that I've gotten was I, I did receive a phone call about a month ago from my caseworker who I didn't even know that I had. Apparently, it had, they switched caseworkers in April, and I just found out about it in late July when she called. But she called just to tell me that they do read these reports and that they, one, that the reason that they were calling is because I check off, you know, they ask you a question of why do you attend 12-step meetings. And I always check off the box that says I go because I have to, that I'm required to. And they called to let me know that that's a huge red flag, that they see that as a predictor of relapse when someone only goes because they're required to. And that's what she said. And I said, no, I'm just telling you that they're not helpful. And there's other things out there that I would, I would, I desperately would love to attend to if we could adjust this. And the answer was no. And that she said, listen, you're entitled to your opinion, but this is how it is. And it was very clear that they see AA, the drug screens and your meeting attendance as the defining diagnostic indicator of the health of your recovery. And I think that's just a bunch of, uh, of hogwash. Personally, um, so that's. You, are you allowed really to go to like smart recovery meetings, or do they have to no. be twelve step? Nope, it is twelve step only. Oh, that's awful. Yeah, and then that's a, so the, the thing is like I don't want to sound like um just this you know PHP or or monitoring program hater because I'm not. Uh, what I'm really interested in is tr how do we make it better? Um, you know, the, I think what we have is a great framework to work with, but I think we've got to start moving out of the punitive mindset. Even when I called to to ask about being on Suboxone, because uh, it wasn't for me, what I found is that, I mean, we could talk about that too, but my, you know, me chasing abstinence only was because I knew that I couldn't be on Suboxone, and I overdosed who knows how many times in and out of treatment, uh, you know, I was in and out of treatment 16 times over a year and a half chasing this abstinence only thing. Uh, because I knew I couldn't be on Suboxone. At least that, that's what the rumor was. I mean, it turns out that you sort of can, but you sort of can't. And I mean, we'll talk about that later too. Uh, but when I called to ask the caseworker, what, what, is, what is the stance on being on buprenorphine? Her, after she explained the process, her, her response was, come on, Bill, you know that everybody is on Suboxone abuses it anyway. We're just using it to get high. So that's the, the mindset of the the nurse monitoring program in the Board of Nursing in Pennsylvania is that you're going to abuse it. I mean, if you look at some of their training materials, it's horrible. There are some of the, with their training materials, their slides, and I can send them to y'all, but I mean, they, they list on there is how do you tell if one of your nurses is impaired? And the symptoms, the top ones are lying and stealing. I mean, so that tells you a, a lot about what we, th how we think about addiction. And I think we have a, a really, really long way to go. Um, you know, until we start to, to fix this stuff. Yeah, I mean, Bill, thank you so much for, for sharing your experience. And, um, you know, the, the, the theme that I think we're all circling around is that there's a, uh, this cookie cutter approach and everyone is uh, individual and addiction is, is a highly complex and individualized, uh, you know, illness and I think if uh, everyone is viewed as, as having the same problems, then everyone getting the same treatment, there, there's no other area of healthcare that works that way. Everything is individualized and tailored to what that person needs. And it just sounds like that's what you want and uh, there's roadblocks keeping you from getting it. Yeah, I mean, and, I mean, I would love to see a change. And I mean, that's sort of what I'm devoting my life to, to doing is, trying to figure out how can we work together to make this better for people. Because, I mean, I've, I've heard from so many other nurses off, ever since we started the podcast, so many nurses who have either voluntarily given up their license because they looked at it and said, I can't do this. And, I mean, like Sean was saying, I think that fa that's a big factor. And when we look at success rates, you know, how many people don't even go into it? Because that's what I did in the beginning. I, it took me seven years until I finally agreed to go into it. Um, you know, so I voluntarily gave up my license for a long time. And we're talking about, a, you know, this wasn't some uh, 
nonchalant thing. This was a career and a job that I absolutely loved. Uh, I mean, it's very difficult to explain what it was like the day that I received the termination letter from Penn. I mean, I loved being an ER nurse. And so to give that up because I thought the obstacle and the mountain to climb to satisfy these requirements was just so out of touch for me. I think mm-hmm. it's that's, that's a terrible thing. And the other thing, like when we're talking about buprenorphine for patients, I, I'm really concerned with with this difference of how we treat our own, that we, that we restrict it for our own, but we're supposed to give it to other patients. How is that going to spread stigma, both with healthcare professionals and patients, that if healthcare professionals are looking at this medication for a highly stigmatized disorder, and we're going to give people buprenorphine, but we know we're not going to give it to our own if they suffer, like what does that really say to us about that medication and about the disorder? And I hope that's clear of what I'm trying to get at. I mean, I think it, it just sends a really, really bad message that people who suffer from this are very different, and um, maybe I'm not explaining it well, but I'm really worried that we're making this distinction that we can give it to these people but not this other group of people. Yes, Zach, can I add one thing here? Oh, absolutely. I, yeah, Leo touched on a, on a great point, and it's something I think – when you're in one of these professional programs, people lose sight of, and that the programs are now tr- historically they were designed to help, you know, and lift, you know, lift your colleagues up, but they're really monitoring programs. They're they're not about your support. They're not really about physician health and wellness. What they are is about protecting the board and protecting the physician's health program. And um, I think it's hard for people to wrap their head around it. And, and it's, you know, I'm not lashing out at them. That's just the way they are. They are, they collect data. Um, and that data is, and I think it varies from state. Massachusetts sounds like it's a little bit warmer and fuzzier. Pennsylvania is not really like that. Um, and I think it's, you know, we want warm and fuzzy. We want to feel good. We want to feel supported loved, respected, you know, with there's so much shame and, sig- and stigma with substance use disorders, and you don't really get that. Um, and I think it's a huge thing that's missing. And it's also when we look, you know, when we're looking at these things, it's very easy to say they're not doing this and not doing that. And, and they're not great in a lot of ways, but in other ways, they're, they're doing their job. And I think one of the, one of the tricky things is that they sell the program as protecting the public. And and I always say, if we're protecting the public, we should be testing, monitoring, providing support and therapy to healthcare professionals that are in practice out in the community doing the work. Not the one that got, you know, caught in the web and it's getting tested multiple times a week and is getting therapy. And yes, they need support and testing too, but what about the majority of practitioners that are out there that we know are smoking marijuana, are taking Ambien for sleep, are taking too much Benadryl, are drinking NyQuil, are taking benzodiazepines, you know, the shopping list of medications that we know that clearly they're impaired, that are sleep deprived, you know, all the things that Peter and Leo brought up. And so I, I just, you know, it's a, that's a, it's a big discussion in itself, but it's something I think that's really important. I, I definitely want to, you know, just thank everyone for for making this conversation, um, you know, be incredibly impactful. Thanks everyone for for coming and listening. And Bill, Peter, and Sean, keep doing what you're doing. And any last words, any final thoughts? Definitely feel free to chime in. And I hope we keep this conversation going because I think uh, as we we I think we really tapped into something here. I think everyone has a lot to contribute. A lot of uh, ideas in the future going forward. So we should all, uh, you know, stick together and, and keep it going. Well, Zach, thanks for organizing it. This was awesome. Thank you, Peter. So You're, yeah, thank you all yeah. so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for, uh, I do, I really appreciate doing this. I mean, there's still so much more that we could talk about, but I think this is a great door opening for at least having a broader discussion out there because it's something that's yes. probably been needed to be spoken about for a long time. Thank you for listening to Health Professionals in Recovery. Please visit our website at www.healthprosinrecovery.com and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. 
You can also follow us on Twitter at HPIR Podcast. If you are struggling with substance use disorder and need help, please call the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration at 1-800-662-4357. Take it from us, people can and do recover.